Hello everyone, Fixer here, and I have another weekly update for the fourth week in A Tale in the Desert, tale number eight. This video is going to cover everything from midday Friday, March 23rd, until midday March 30th. This video is being recorded on Friday afternoon, and it's not going to go up till Saturday. So keep in mind, some things may be outdated. A lot of things can happen in that short period of time. And of course, I am in Hyksos, and therefore all my mesh and cush news and information could be outdated as well. So verify any of that information before you do anything hasty. All right, let's start as usual with research. Keep in mind that the darker green checks represent new technology unlocked this week for the respective factions. I will only comment on some of the newer techs unlocked this week. Let's start with advanced metallurgy. This brings us alloys like uh, brass, bronze, steel, and pewter. These can be made in a, a reactory in combination with um, some specific resins. Barley cultivation was unlocked by the Kush faction. This brings us barley, obviously, and barley is used in cooking, it's feed for chickens, it's got many uses. And of course it prepares us for beer drinking. Water mining was opened up by the Kush. This lets us place special mines that sit in the water and they pull up gems and cuttable gems. Kush and Hyksos have both unlocked masonry. This brings us uh, cement and concrete. Dozens of buildings in the near future will require concrete to build, so make sure you not only pick the tech up, but uh, participate in a group effort to produce it as soon as you can. Kush has unlocked gardening, which brings us the ability to build greenhouses. Greenhouses let you go grass on a larger scale, no more picking it up one by one or, or using the offline time. At least for Kush, Hyksos and Meshwesh are still plucking it up out of the ground. Deep well construction was unlocked by Kush. This allows us to pull up petroleum out of the ground. And petroleum is uh, used as one of the fuel options in clinker vats, which produce cement and concrete. And it's also used in various forms of research, petroleum that is. Lastly, and once again only opened up by the Kush, is viticulture. Viticulture lets us build vineyards and we can grow grapes on the vineyards. When you go to pick up this tech at a University of Worship, make sure you pick up your vine clipping as well. And of course that opens up winemaking. So as you can see, a lot of important techs opened up this week. And not only that, it looks like we are about to jump headfirst into two player favorite mechanics in beer and winemaking. Moving on to new tests unlocked. It wouldn't be Tale 8 if I didn't get to announce another accidental unlocking at the University of Progress. The test of the Takascot was accidentally unlocked this week. This is a test of the human body where teams of various sizes face off on pre-built courts that are placed around the map. In the past, this test has suffered from not enough interest in order to pass people, but perhaps hopefully this tale that won't be the case. I'm not going to go into the specifics on how this game works. What I'll do is I'll place a link to one of the old wikis down in the description below next to the timestamp. So if you would like to learn more about it, you can click on it and go there. The Test of Towers was also unlocked this week. So this is a more interesting test than uh, the Obelisk, in my opinion. The Hour of Towers happens every three days. And when that hour arrives, you build towers across Egypt. And it's called Hour of Towers, but I believe it's actually like a 20-minute window. And you control all the land that is closest to your towers. So a single uncontested tower will control 100% of Egypt. When the Hour of Towers ends, scores are then placed in the system channel, and the score that you receive will be counted towards your permanent score to pass the test. So let's say you built a tower and you got 12% of Egypt. That 12% is now part of your permanent score. And you have to reach 100% in order to pass the test. Now I'm going to put up a map of Egypt on the screen. And I'll overlay it with what is called a Voronoi diagram to visually demonstrate how this works. So each tower on the map has a colored region around it that shows all quad trees closer to it than any other tower on the map. So while this may not be completely 100% accurate, uh, I don't really care as long as you get the gist of how the area is determined around your tower. Got it? Maybe? I hope so. 
All right, let's move on to old tests. Of course, we're going to start with the test of the singing cicada. I guess we missed a day or two of reporting, or at least no one reported them on the wiki, so I only got March 24th and the 28th for you. But I would hazard a guess that any other advancements happened around the same points. Another thing worth noting is that the word is out that cages have gone down to five bugs again. So go to a University of Body before you head on out to see if you can buy one. Of course, by the time this goes up, that could change. So you should probably check anyways. And apparently there have been no passes in the test of marriage, the test of souls, or in the test of chains. Moving on to regions and what was gained and what was lost on Sunday. As someone who has participated in tributes every week, this Sunday was, was easily, by far, the craziest Sunday so far. There were runners all over Egypt. The tributes were massive amounts in various places. I myself went to check on Suez and there was a Kush runner standing there just camping Suez all by herself. I think the tribute was, was sheet glass or something like that. I didn't have any on me. I had no plans to, to put tribute in there. So we just made small talk. And while we were talking, two people from Meshwest showed up and they started camping the tribute as well. Again, like I said, I didn't have any on me, so I bolted, but um, from what I understand, they were camping the tribute for quite a long time. And there were reports of this happening in various other regions as well. So let's start with regions lost. A lot of regions changed hands this week. Hyksos lost six, Kush lost four, and Meshwest lost eight total regions. As far as regions gained, Hyksos picked up 10, Kush picked up 3, and Meshwish didn't pick up any. Sad face. In total region distribution by faction, Hyksos has 16, Kush has 9, and Meshwish has 8. It is worth noting that Puinet was not picked up by anybody this week, but instead, I think it was on Monday, Pascalito of the Kush used a token of Ra in order to force a region to count their tributes. We don't know what the new tribute was at Puinet, but obviously they dumped something on it, forced it to count, and Puinet then chose allegiance with Kush for the week. That is the first time this has happened this tale, probably not going to be the last. An official event this week which began on March 30th called a Hippity Hoppin' Easter Egg Hunt. This event lasts until April 2nd, and scattered about Egypt are loads and loads of Easter eggs. Many players have reported that they found them near trees or bushes. And on Sunday, we'll have a choice to whom to give these eggs. Whichever entity has the most eggs at the end of the event will be declared the winner. First up is the University of Architecture. If they get the most eggs out of this event, they will then give us stable bonfires. Now, they did not specify what exactly that meant, but it is worth noting that bonfires do decay this tail. I'm not sure everybody got the PSA on that, because I've seen a lot of bonfires out and about. They do decay, and the last I heard, I don't know if this number is still true, but it was true in beta, it was at 5% per day of wood that they lose. So hopefully stable bonfires will get rid of that. Next up is the Meshwesh. Tribal leadership said that they will increase free transit time at the chariots if the Meshwesh get the most eggs. In Hyksos, if the tribal leadership there gets the most eggs, they decrease the cost of faction buildings in Hyksos territory. And if the tribal leadership in Kush gets the most eggs, they will put out higher performance roads in Kush territory. Now, it wasn't specified whether Kush were the only ones to get that bonus or not, so that'll be interesting to find out. And the stranger even chimed in. He said that if he gets the most Easter eggs, if you take your eggs and give them to the stranger, he will unlock three tests for us without us having to demonstrate with resources. Now on the surface, that may not seem like a good deal, but there's three or four tests out there that have some ridiculous requirements. So I think this is an option some people might be taking seriously. 
And lastly, if you open up your egg on Sunday, there will be a surprise in it waiting for you. We do not know what the surprise is. Maybe it's rabbits, maybe it's chickens, maybe it's something completely different, who knows. But you do have the option of keeping the egg for yourself and opening it up on Sunday. That's it for official events, we'll now move on to player events. Again, just like last week, all events that I am listing here are being put on by Rabble. So slash info Rabble, R-A-B-B-L-E, if you'd like to get more information. On Saturday, March 31st, there is a coordinated acro line. This will be at 4 p.m. GMT, which is 12 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. This will be held at the Lahoon Acro Field. And keep in mind that the return chariot is not open. So if you do visit there and you have a chariot point to spend, perhaps spend it on the Lahoon Chariot Stop. Next up is a bauxite dig. This is happening in the same location last week in South Sinai. It is happening Sunday, April 1st at 4 p.m. GMT, which is 12 p.m. Eastern Time. And lastly, another gypsum dig. Again, in the same place as last time over in Ammonium. This will be on Sunday, April 1st, later in the day, 7 p.m. GMT, which is 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. It is recommended that you bring five slate shovels or one iron shovel. There is slate located at the dig, so if you wanted to make them on site, you'll be able to do that. And of course, grilled onions is everyone's friend over at digs. Let's you dig up things quicker with higher endurance. So let's talk about laws real quick, because over the past week, the ballots opened up and the factions voted and then they already closed. And we have winners, although we don't know who the winners are yet because they have not been posted. It's worth keeping in mind that laws are faction-based this tale and not Egypt-wide. So anything Hyksos votes into law will not apply in Meshwesh or Kush-controlled regions. I'm not sure how I'm going to handle talking about laws in future videos, because at this time I don't really have an easy way to view each faction's ballots. And covering each ballot is probably a bit out of scope of this series. However, once the ballots are completed and the results are in and publicized, then I'll probably include them in the videos. All right, we're moving on to guilds. I've got one guild to tell you about this week. That would be Meshworks over in the Meshwesh territory. Coordinates are on the screen. It's located just above Tanis. If you are a new or solar player, this is a good place to check out get you access to some newer technologies you may not otherwise have. A new idea has been put forward called the Egyptian Union. I'm going to put a link to the wiki down at the timestamp below because you're going to probably want to read this for yourself. According to the wiki, the Egyptian Union has been founded with the goal of providing decision-making services across faction boundaries. In no way is it intended to remove powers from the factions themselves. Rather, it should be a supplemental tool for cooperation and conflict resolution. It appears to be some sort of United Nations and to try to circumvent the faction system. At least that's what it looks like to me. However, I did have a discussion with one of the creators in this guild who claims that he talked to Mallard already about this. And he claims that Mallard has already told him that he would put this in the game if it were written properly and voted into law. So if that's true, this is probably something everyone should take seriously Take a moment, go down to the link below, and, and read what they're trying to do here. The current Pharaoh's Angler is Phoenix WCU with 2,156 fish. That's an outrageous amount of fish. And I'm going to pass on the Pharaoh's Acrobat for now because it has not been updated in about a week and a half or two weeks or so. So I'm going to leave that out of these videos until that gets updated. And the census. It looks like Egypt is still growing at 696 citizens. Looks like more and more players are completing body tests. I'm going to probably have to find a, a better way to show you guys the census in future videos. So we have a bit of a public service announcement today, Building on Clay. 
It appears to have happened to a few people, so I felt I, I should probably include that in this video. This is a reminder to be careful building anything on clay because it's going to subside, as in disappear. I don't know what the exact time frame is. It's probably a week. You get a, you get a little note when you click on the building on how much it's subsided. As far as compounds are concerned, Mallard said that it checks for where the doorway is located. If the doorway is on clay, your compound is going to subside. However, if it is not and your compound stretches out to a little bit over the clay, you're probably not um, needing to worry about that. At least for now. Who knows if that could change in the future. I would recommend just not building on clay at all until you got yourself a Rayleigh oven. If you do have something built on clay, it was mentioned that you'll get a, a one-time GM call to move whatever it is you built on clay, whether it's a, a warehouse or your compound or whatnot. So um, I haven't heard that that was rescinded, so if you do have something on clay, perhaps place a GM call and see if they'll do something about it. Moving on to what's new in the Desert Nomad store. This week, Mallard put in the Otter for 2,000 perk points. Some of you probably have perk points from when you pre-ordered a game. Otherwise, you can just buy the perk points separately. You can own more than one, and while the page says that it follows you around when you call them, it doesn't appear to act like a cat. I don't know if that is a bug or a feature at this point. I got myself an otter, and when I call him, he'll run up to the point where I was, but if I bolt and take off, he'll just chill to where I called him. And he doesn't follow me around. I talked briefly with Mallard and he did say that monkeys are right around the corner. He's going to be working on those and hopefully we'll see those in the next week or so. It was also mentioned in Discord that Raswa, who was brought onto the dev team to do art, is currently working on avatar upgrades. They say they're doing their best to make avatars as customizable as they can. Sounds like something a lot of people in this community would uh, welcome quite a lot. I think that about does it for the update this week. Of course, I'm always on the prowl for news and information from all three factions. I'm looking for guilds that help out the public with new technology. I'm looking for specialty guilds that focus on either disciplines or tests or even just winemaking. It doesn't really matter. Something that the public would probably be interested in and participating. There were a lot of people this week who gave me a hand in, in putting together some of the shots and whatnot for this video. So at, at the end of these videos, I'm going to start putting up a little thank you page. I'll let you guys know that I appreciate everything you've done for me to get these out to the people as soon as possible. So thank you again, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.